Chapter 14 Silas woke in his clothes and boots, only a few minutes late, and stood in the shower until the hot water ran out. He spat foul mouthwash in the sink and opened and closed his lips in the mirror, his head shady with fuzz. The idea of buzzing his razor over it was appalling, so he set his hat on gently and finished buttoning his shirt going out the door and took his headache to work, bumping along in the jeep that smelled vaguely of cigarettes and Irina's perfume. The end of the night was a blur. Him fleeing, her hobbling to the door in one boot, saying if he was going to be such a dud, would he at least drop her back at the party? He was pretty sure he hadn't, though he owned little memory of getting home. At least he'd woke up in his own bed. There was a message from Angie on his cell, about eleven, asking if he was coming over. Another at midnight. Where was he? It was seven-thirty when he got to Chabot Town Hall. Today, being Angie's day off, it was too early for him to call her back. So he crossed the parking lot and stood wincing at the passing cars and trucks as the mill screamed at him, and each bleat of his whistle jabbed a hot wire in the mush behind his eyes. I know that look, Marla said when he came in the hub, still wearing his vest, already drenched with sweat. Seen you drag an ass over the parking lot. She got up off her stool and handed him a cup of coffee. He thanked her, then went to his table in the back and stripped away the vest and eased his hat off, resisted the urge to put his head down. Marla chatted with another customer. But then here she came a few minutes later with two sausage biscuits on a styrofoam plate and, more important, a bottle of bare aspirin. She slid into the chair across from him and pushed the breakfast across the table and opened the bear. Thanks, he said, taking three of the pills and washing them down with coffee. Tie one on? More like nodded it. I remember when I used to drink. Problem is, what I don't remember. What was the occasion? Guilt, he said. Marla lit a cigarette. Ah, guilt. Opiate of the Baptists. You want to talk about it? No, I done done too much of that. Don't seem to help much. The bell over the door rang, and she rose with her cigarette. Well, sugar, she said, limping off. Don't be too hard on yourself. Now and again, it's okay to let yourself off the hook. But that was his trouble, wasn't it? Letting himself off the hook had been his way of life. He stopped by town hall. Von Seal was balancing the town's budget, gospel music leaking around her iPod's earbuds. Reckon you can write a few tickets today? She asked. I'll try. He sat down at his desk, felt the biscuits churning. Guess who else called? Shannon. She says you're avoiding her. He pretended to be interested in his reports. You ain't never been shy about talking to her before, 32. What's up now? Her phone rang before he could answer, and he slipped out. He drove to Folsom, past Automotive, where somebody had spray-painted Serial Killer across the door. Two of the office windows were broken, too. The gas pump nozzles gone. Stolen. Silas kept going. At the hospital, he saw three news vans in the lot, their dishes up, reporters standing in the shade, smoking cigarettes. Word was out. The killer had awakened. From here, Silas thought, it would only get worse for Larry. He pulled into the lot and radioed the sheriff's department, tried to get a read on French's day. Dispatch told him French had gone to Oxford to interview and hopefully pick up Charles Deacon, the suspect in Eminem's murder. He'd be back after dark. Did Silas want the sheriff? No, thanks, he said. He sat a moment longer, looking up at Larry's room. Then he rattled the jeep into first and eased back onto the highway. He drove out to Larry Ott Road, past the mailbox, beat all to hell. He turned in and drove to Larry's house, and got out with his feed jug, walked around the house through the tall grass, fed the chickens, stood watching them, the rain having taken care of their watering. French, he knew, would talk to Larry again, try to get him to solidify the drugged-out confession, but the chief was gone, and that gave Silas a day. He left the barn and walked out toward where he'd molded the four-wheeler tracks, the one with a nail in it. Wasn't anything unusual about people four-wheeling, 
or even doing it on Scary Larry's property. There it was, smeared now, all the rain, but he stood looking down at it, ruts through sprigs of high weeds. He began to walk the field, his pants brushed by weeds and growing wet, thinking what was he missing, ranging toward the trees and back, the barn distant now. He saw a paps can and stared at it a while, was looking for a stick to use as a place marker when he noticed a fresh set of four-wheeler tracks. And there it was, again, the circle imprint, the nail. Whoever this was, he kept coming back. He saw something else, other whirls in the mud by the tracks. Footprints. This fellow had gotten off his four-wheeler here, hadn't he? He spent another hour wandering the land, bagged the paps can, then thought, since he was out here, he could go see this Wallace Stringfellow, ask him about a rattlesnake in a mailbox. The jeep backfired as he climbed the steep hill on Seven, and when he topped it and coasted down the other side, he passed the catfish farm and saw the oxygen man riding his four-wheeler between ponds. Silas waved and slowed, passing the driveway of a crumpled house up on blocks. Dirty aluminum siding. Satellite dish on the roof. Dirt yard and scrubby trees. There was a mean-looking dog. Some pit bull mixed with something else. A chow, maybe, tied to a wooden stake, getting up and barking, pulling at its rope. Brown, with pointed ears, tail down, head the size of a watermelon. No water bowl in sight. No shade. There was his angle, if he wanted it mistreated animal. He could use that to get to the door, maybe inside. French always said you wanted an interview subject in your office, on your turf, where you were comfortable. But Silas wanted to see the snakes. There was a beat-up sedan in the drive, and a four-wheeler parked by the wooden added on deck. No name on the mailbox, just its number. He cruised on by, holding his radio. Miss Foncille. Yeah? Can you tell me who lives at 60215 County Road 7? Yeah, hon. Give me a few minutes. Thanks. Little father he pulled off, parked and waited, his headache better, thinking later he'd go get some more of those tire molds from the sheriff's department. 32? Von Seal on the radio. Yes, ma'am. I got a name. Is it Wallace Stringfeller? I'm sure he is. What's going on? Might be our snake in the box. I'm gonna go talk to him, if he's home. You want some company? No. I'll call if I do. Be careful. Yes, ma'am. He put the radio on the passenger seat and drove back to the house and pulled into the driveway. The dog scrambled to its feet, barking, its rope lashed to an old leather collar, its head low. Easy, Cujo, Silas said, getting out. The dog pulled at its rope, straining its collar, frothing, batting at the air with its front paws. Easy, boy. Hoping the stake held, Silas eased around the patch of yard that defined the dog's orbit, unsnapping his sidearm. He circled toward the house, keeping an eye on the pit bull, aware, with all this noise, that Stringfellow would know he was coming. The yard all tracked up from cars and the four-wheeler, and it was these tracks he wanted to examine see if they had the same circle in the tread he'd noticed in Larry's yard. Hey! Somebody coming out. Silas glanced again at the pit bull, then went to the porch where Wallace Stringfellow stood shirtless and skinny, blue jeans, a cigarette smoking in one hand, cup of coffee in the other, a few paps cans on the rail. Hey there, Silas said at the bottom of the porch steps. He had to speak loudly to be heard. How you doing? not looking him in the eye. I help you? This your residence? Looking out toward the road, at the dog. Yeah. That your animal? Stringfellow closed the door and stood on the porch. Yeah. Shut up! He yelled. You need something? Just want to talk to you. You got a minute? I ain't rode on the highway no more. Just off road, like you said. I'm glad to hear it. The dog was loud. He put a hand to his ear. Uh, can we talk? Inside. The young man looked behind him. The door. He pulled on the knob. Ain't got no time right now. 
I'm in the middle of something. Silas came up the steps and Stringfellow backed away. He dropped his cigarette over the rail. He was barefooted. He looked at the cup in his hand and set it on the rail behind him, among the beer cans. What you want to go inside for? Or so I can hear. What for? I just want to ask you a few questions. About what? That dog. Stringfellow looked toward the road behind him. He shrugged and got his coffee mug and opened the door. Silas followed him in, taking a deep, silent breath, not smelling the marijuana or meth he'd hoped to, just beer and cigarettes and filth. He spotted an ashtray on the coffee table, but saw no roach or paraphernalia. The room was small and shadowed, its Venetian blinds drawn, fast food wrappers on the table, a row of aquariums along the counter, each screened at the top and containing a snake or two or three. It was hard to tell. Their bodies looped and strung over limbs and coiled in the dark corners, all perfectly still, like rubber snakes. You a reptile collector? Silas asked, remembering Larry saying herpetologist, keeping an eye on Stringfellow where he'd retreated in the corner, rubbing his coffee mug like he was rosining a baseball. When he noticed he was doing it, he set it on the windowsill and pushed his hands in his pockets. It's a hobby, he said, pulling out a package of camels and a lighter. Mind if I look? Silas asked him. Snakes and me, we don't always get along. This here's how I like him, behind glass. Stringfellow was having trouble getting his lighter to work. Go on. Silas went around the counter into the kitchen, scanning the room, the aquariums between the two of them, and bent, his face inches from a fat cotton mouth, lying like a big burnt arm. He could see its frozen frown, the pits under its slit eyes, flicking tongue the only sign he was alive. Through the smeared glass, Stringfellow got his cigarette lit. What was it you wanted? He asked. I'm kind of busy. Silas moved to the next aquarium. This snake smaller, brightly banded in red, yellow, and black. This a coral snake? He asked, remembering the rhyme Larry had taught him. Red on black, a friend of Jack. Red on yellow, kill a fellow. Now, Stringfellow said. King snake. Is it true to eat a rattlesnake? Swallow it whole? What I always heard. They never tried it, though. Silas stood straight. His eyes better adjusted to the dark room and saw a monster mask on a shelf by another aquarium, on a bookcase over against the wall. It was familiar. A zombie. That mask, he said. Stringfellow followed his eyes. Where'd you get it? Fidgeting. I don't know. Don't know. Someplace. Outside, the dog continued to bark. Wait a second, Stringfellow said. Oh, just hang on. He was sweating now, sucking on his camel. He crossed to the door. Hey! Silas hurried around the counter, following him outside, on the porch, down the steps, expecting to see Stringfellow fleeing. Instead, he was over by the dog, yelling for him to shut the fuck up. Silas came down the steps, gripping his pistol in his holster. Hey, he called again. Hang on! Stringfellow's hands trembled as he got the pit bull by its collar, the animal growling now and snapping, focused on Silas. I'm just going to try and get him calm. The dog bit backward and nipped Stringfellow's wrist. He let go, but had its collar with the other hand and with the bleeding one he hit the back of its head. You some bitch! Back up, Silas was saying, coming around the porch, reaching for his radio and not finding it. He reached in his pocket for a cell phone. Hey! He called again. When Stringfellow unclipped the dog, it was like he'd set off a cannon. He hit the ground once, then came at Silas in the air before he could draw his weapon, was on him, tearing his arms and hands, growling like a motor gone haywire in its ribs. They fell hard, him pushing at the hot, slick jaw and trying to keep his face away and get his hand around its throat. He closed his eyes and turned his head and batted at the face, and then it got his arm. He felt the deep teeth. Somebody, he, was yelling, wrestling the dog in the mud, his elbow in its muzzle, a bone snapping. 
With his other hand, he clutched the loose fur of its throat and closed his fist, felt the cable of its windpipe in his grip and latched on. Then he heard a shot, very close and rolled. Another shot, loud and ringing. The dog yelped, blood on its fur. It was hit. Or he was. Dog trying to get away now, but now it was Silas wouldn't let go. Using it for a shield. Stringfellow yelling, get him! They rolled under the porch. Silas heard another shot and saw the man's running legs, bare feet, felt cold mud in his arm. The dog was trembling, and he lay behind it, fumbling for his gun. Shit smell everywhere. Another shot. Mud splashing in his eyes. He clung to the pit bull, the dog shaking and biting weakly at him. Silas had his pistol now, awkward in his right hand. He put the barrel to the back of its head and fired. It shivered once and lay still. Stringfellow's footsteps over the porch, loud ringing shots as he fired into the wood, yelling, Killed my dog! Silas was scrabbling under the house, his left arm numb and useless. He could feel his heart pushing out blood. Overhead, the front door slammed and Stringfellow thundered over the floor, still yelling about his dog. Silas crawled past pipes in the muck and more beer cans and toward the light at the other end. Stink of sewage came out the same time Stringfellow leaped from the back door, holding a long revolver. He didn't see Silas behind him on the ground, aiming his shivering pistol with his right arm. He fired and missed and fired again. The young man screamed and fell, but got up, holding his thigh and limping away, shooting blindly, a window shattering, echo of aluminum siding. Then he made the pine trees at the edge of the yard, through the barbed wire, and was gone. Silas lay breathing hard, fighting to stay awake, his mouth so dry. He looked at his arm and saw how bad he was bleeding, saw a jag of bone, mud and straw in the wound. He set his pistol down and tried to tear off his shirt for a bandage, but his strength was gone. He looked behind him under the house, past the mound of dead dog, saw his taser flatten in the muck, saw his jeep's tires. He pulled himself up and stood against the siding. He remembered his cell phone, but couldn't find it. The door was open, hip level, no steps. He lay backward in it and pulled his legs inside. Holding his hurt arm, which looked like hamburger meat, he got to his knees, rising in air that smelled of cordite, using the wall to prop himself up. The room blurred. No telephone, just a cordless base on the end table. He clutched his arm, warm blood running through his fingers, he lurched across the floor and fell over a table, upsetting an aquarium, glass breaking, a rattlesnake's dry buzz filling the room. He rolled onto his back and saw the snake slide over the carpet, saw the monster mask looking down from its shelf. He wanted to get up, but couldn't let his hurt arm go. He was freezing, the snake crawling by his head. Chapter 15 after breakfast, the deputy watching as he ate, saying no, French wasn't back yet, Larry asked the nurse to put night shift in his hand, and spent the afternoon wandering through the familiar stories, difficult as it was to hold the book and turn pages with one tired hand. The words were harder to see, too, from this angle, and it occurred to him that he'd been holding books farther and farther away from his eyes these last years, that he needed reading glasses. When he got out, he'd make an appointment to see an eye doctor. In the afternoon, he called the deputy back in. Y'all said he'd come this evening, Larry said. I got something he'll want to hear. It's been an incident, the deputy, Skip said. He's out investigating a crime scene. He might be a while. W what do you mean? We had an officer hurt. Hurt? Yeah, that black fella kept coming in here. One watched you on night shift. Silas Jones? Yeah. What about him? He went to see a fella, and the fella sicked a pit bull on him and took some shots at him. Larry knew the answer before he asked. Was the fella... Was his name Wallace Stringfella? Skip looked at him. Shit, it's on TV already? No. The deputy watched him a moment longer. Is he okay? Don't know. He's down in surgery now, what I'm told. Dog took a big old chunk of him. 
Chief French and the sheriff and them, they out at Stringfellow's house now. Is it any way I can talk to Chief French? It's important. It's about Wallace Stringfellow. Skip said wait and went in the hall. A moment later he came back with his radio and Larry heard French's voice crackle over it. Skip held it up for him to use. Talk when I mash the button. Chief French? Background noise. Other radios. Men talking. Yep, go ahead. This is Larry Ott in the hospital. Static. Go ahead. I've been waiting to tell you. I think it was Wallace Stringfella shot me. Took that girl, too. How you know that? He started telling it. Skip holding the radio with his mouth slowly opening as Larry talked. How Wallace knew of the cabin where they found the girl. His last visit. How Larry had recognized his eyes behind the mask when the fellow shot him. The voice that had asked him to die. Mask? French asked. Describe it. Larry did, leaning up, his back sweaty. Is Silas okay? More static. I got to go, French said. Thanks for the information. I'll be there when I can. Later that night, Larry woke and heard French outside. He and the night shift deputy spoke in low tones. Then French came in the room smelling of cigarettes and sweat, wearing a black T-shirt with a pistol on it, pointing at Larry. Gun control, it said, means hitting where you aim. He had a large plastic bag with what looked like a severed head inside. Larry's mask. The chief set the mask on the other bed and then, gently, undid the restraint on his right wrist and came around the bed and did the same to the one on his left. He tossed them aside and sat on the other bed and took off his glasses, looking tired, and rubbed the bridge of his nose. What a day, he said. He reached for the mask and held it up for Larry to see, its eyes dead now and black. Can you identify this? Yeah, Larry said. It's mine. French tossed the bag back and folded his arms. Larry watched it, remembered ordering it, racing his bike to the mailbox every morning, hoping for the box that was so big the mailman would have to lean it against the post. You'll get it back, French said but for now we got to keep it. I don't want it. Just throw it away. French's radio blared and he mumbled something in it. When he signed off, Larry said, How Silas? In recovery. Will he be okay? Looks like it. Don't know if that army is be any good. That damn pit bull about tow it off. John Wayne Gacy, Larry said. What? That's the dog's name. Was his name. French put his glasses back on and felt his back pocket for a pad and wrote that down. Now, what's left of its head is on its way to Jackson to get tested for rabies and its body's on the way to the incinerator. Well, how's Wallace? Dead. What happened? Watch the news, the chief said. You'll find out. Larry lay back. How would you characterize your relationship with him? French asked. With Wallace Stringfella. I thought he was my friend. You got a strange taste in friends. I don't know if you've noticed, Larry said. But I ain't had a lot of options. French stopped writing, but didn't look up. You've been the only person inside my house since they come took my mama. Larry said. In a way, you were the closest thing I had to a friend till Wallace came. Yeah, well, can you tell me about him? Larry thought of the show about the serial killer and the killer who imitated him. He thought of how he used to catch snakes and bring them to school. He thought about the boy in his barn, the boy in church, that grown boy coming back a decade later in a stolen direct TV truck. He thought about Pap's beer and marijuana the pistol, the only Christmas present he'd gotten in twenty-five years. We were both lonesome, he said. I think that's why he came to see me in the first place. I don't think he had anybody to look up to, a daddy or uncle, and crazy as it sounds, he chose me. You said he came seeing you last when? Night before I got shot. 
Said he'd, said he'd done something. Yeah, but he never told what. But I started to figure it might have been the Rutherford girl. And how come you didn't report this? I tried to. You called 32. He came to see me, there he said. Silas, after y'all questioned me yesterday, all in a hurry like he wasn't supposed to be here, he said he knew I didn't shoot myself or kill that girl. He wanted to know if I could tell him anything to help him figure out who really did it. I'd already started to put it together that it must have been Wallace, that pistol, the cabin, but I didn't tell Silas. I didn't want to talk to him. Well, I ain't good at counseling, French said, but it strikes me it's long past time the two of y'all talked. He picked up the restraints. I got to put these back on for tonight, but I hope we'll be able to get them off tomorrow. Once and for all. When he left, there he lay amid his machines, thinking of silence, how time packs new years over the old ones, but how those old years are still in there like the earliest, tightest rings centering a tree, the most hidden, enclosed in darkness and shielded from weather. But then a saw screams in, and the tree topples, and the circles are stricken by the sun, and the sap glistens and the stump is laid open for the world to see. Larry thought of Wallace, what he'd done to that poor girl, raping her, killing her, burying her in the dirt, thinking what he, Larry, might have done to stop what happened, what he could have said, thinking in a way it was his fault. Wallace's desires tangled and connected in his mind to what he thought Larry had done. Larry sending him home that night instead of understanding. If he was trying to emulate Larry, wasn't it somehow Larry's doing? His fault? And what if he told Silas what he knew when Silas had asked him? Would the outcome have been different? Wallace still alive? Silas with two working arms. He was still trying to untangle it when his door was pushed open by the end of a rolling bed and two nurses wheeled in a sleeping black man, his left arm in a cast. You got a roommate, the nurse said. Silas. Chapter 16 When Silas opened his eyes in the dark early hours of the morning, warm from drugs, he wasn't surprised that he found himself flat on his back under a cast by the hospital window. Beside him, Larry sat propped up in his bed, flicking through channels, not yet aware Silas was awake. For a moment, Silas imagined it had always been like this, that they'd been normal brothers all the years of their rearing, both black or both white, sleeping side by side in matching twin beds. Instead, here they were. Strangers. The sons of Carl Ott, Injured, bandaged, like survivors of an explosion. Except for the flickering TV, it was dark in the room, Skip still stationed by the door. Silas moved his heavy arm, suspended in traction over his chest, his fingers tingling, hot at the ends. In recovery, they told him it would take a while. Some hard rehab, those years of pitching, the damage he'd done then, and now this. His elbow not only broken, but crushed, the tendons torn, muscles ripped, steel screws and pins holding it together. Yet he stood a chance of, eventually, getting most of the arm back, most of the control of his hand, writing, things like that would be the hardest. But he was lucky, he'd been told. Lucky Wallace had missed him with his thirty-eight special, having fired in all six times, hitting the dog once. You got in a fight with a big-ass pit bull, the ER doctor had said, Judging from its bite radius, it's amazing you're alive. Yeah, Silas had mumbled. You should see the other dog. He remembered Angie's worried pucker in the ER lobby. He couldn't tell if her sniffing was allergies or crying, but he was glad she was there, holding the hand that still worked. After surgery, he'd asked the nurse to put him in with Larry Aunt. She'd had to call French, and to Silas's drowsy surprise, he'd okayed it. Now Larry stopped his surfing on the late news, Channel 6, the cute red-headed anchor. She bid the listening world a good day and led with what she called a story of local violence and justice. Shabo Constable Silas Jones, she reported, nicknamed 32, 
while investigating a tip about a man who'd put a rattlesnake in a local woman's mailbox, stumbled instead into a snake den himself. Exterior shots of Wallace's house. There was Silas's jeep, and then inside shots, the aquariums, that big-ass cottonmouth, the king snake, the rattler. When Constable Jones attempted to question the suspect, now identified as Wallace Stringfellow, of Chabot, Stringfellow allegedly set loose his dog, a part pit bull, part chow mix on the police officer. Stills of the dead dog lying in the mud, big as a hog, stills of bullet holes in the porch floor. The officer was seriously injured and the dog killed when Stringfellow allegedly fired at the officer during the attack. What Silas remembered most vividly was that zombie mask. How different would their worlds have been if he'd followed Larry across the road toward his mother's Buick way back when, that long-ago haunted house? What if he just reached out and took Larry's shoulder, said, wait? The anchor was saying the Chabo Town Hall employee, Bon Seal Bradford, unable to reach Constable Jones on a radio, notified the Gerald County Sheriff's Department, who dispatched two cars to the scene. Deputies found Jones unconscious in the house and bleeding seriously, the anchor said. There was also a three-foot-long diamond-backed rattlesnake near his leg. Deputies were able to subdue the snake without incident, and Jones was taken by ambulance to Folsom General Hospital, where he's reportedly in stable condition. The house's occupant, Wallace Stringfellow, fled into the woods and was pursued by deputies. After a brief gun battle, Stringfellow allegedly took his own life before deputies could apprehend him. No other injuries were reported. But here, she said, her nostrils flaring the way Silas had always liked, he saw now because it reminded him of Angie, is where the story takes a surprising turn. Deputies, searching Stringfellow's property, discovered not only illegal drugs and drug paraphernalia, but surprising evidence in another case. The television switched to French's badly lit face, a hasty news conference outside Stringfellow's house. Search in Mr. Stringfellow's residence, French said. We found a wallet that belonged to Tina Rutherford. Rutherford is the General County Ole Miss student, the anchor filled in, who, missing for nine days, was discovered by Constable Jones last week, brutally murdered and buried in a hunting cabin on the property of local business owner Larry Ott. Ott has been a suspect in the murder since. Back to French. We can't comment on these findings yet. Does this, a reporter called off camera, clear Larry Ott? As I say, French repeated. We can't comment yet. Not such a quiet rural community these days, the anchor finished. We'll keep you updated as this story develops. And now to Afghanistan, where... Silas felt for the button that raised the top half of his bed. When he began to move, there he muted the television. You're a hero, he said, watching Silas. Hey, Silas said, better sitting up. Ain't we a pair? Larry looked back at the television and clicked the sound back on and began to surf channels again. Silas lowered his chin and thought about how to say what he needed to say. He had no idea where to begin. Larry, he said, there's something I need to tell you. Some things. Larry continued to click. Go ahead. Could you turn that TV off? Larry ignored him. Well, Silas turning toward him, seeing as you still attached to your bed, you ain't got much choice but to listen. Which Larry did. Partway through, he muted the television. A few moments later, he turned it off, and the room was dark except for the watchful gray and green eyes of their machines. Talking, Silas could see how still Larry was as he heard about the picture of Alice holding him and about Silas's visit to River Acres. He sat without moving until Silas stopped, and it was the end, the end where the two lay now with their injuries side by side in a hospital, both of them silent, neither moving as the moon pushed the shadows of the room along the floor and walls with its soft yellow light. Silas felt flattened by the truth, or the telling of it, his lungs empty and raw, and the spaces behind his eyes throbbing. We're brothers he said. Half-brothers. Did you know? No, Larry said then. Yeah. Ever since y'all got in our truck that morning, I knew something. Then when Mama give y'all them coats. Silas remembering Larry's breezy mother, 
so different from now, saying how Alice should have no trouble accepting the codes because she never minded using other people's things. He wished you'd been the white one, Barry said. Silas thinking how Mrs. Odd had driven away, and Silas had put on his coat and sipped it to his neck and buried his hands in the pockets, which were lined with fur. But his mother continued to stand in the freezing air, holding the coat she'd been given, looking at it. Ain't you gonna put it on, Mama? He'd asked as they started to walk, her carrying the long gray coat as if someone had handed her a dead child. At some point Alice slipped one arm, and then the other into the coat sleeves. She buttoned its buttons, starting at the top. Silas had followed her, still not seeing what an emblem of defeat, shame, loss, hopelessness the coat was. With such gaps in his understanding, he saw very clearly how the boy he'd been had grown to be the man he was. You think it was better? Larry said. Living with him? No, Silas admitted. I expect it wasn't. Then he said, it wasn't easy without one either. I used to wish I was you. All that land and all them guns. That warm house. That barn. Bet you don't wish it now, Larry said. Silas didn't know how to answer, but it didn't matter. Larry was thumbing his buzzer. The nurse walked into the room. Yes? How much trouble would it be, Larry asked her, to move me to another room? She blinked and then closed her mouth. You? You want to change rooms? Yeah. Please start whatever paperwork you have to. I'll pay whatever extra it costs. I just want my own room. Please. Well, he's out tomorrow, the nurse said, nodding to Silas. He'll be gone before we could move you. But if you want me to go to the trouble of starting the paperwork, I do, he said. Chapter 17 Where Larry's only visitors have been law enforcement officials, Silas had a stream. Not long after Larry asked to change rooms, a pretty black girl in a paramedic outfit came in, smiled quickly at Larry, then went to Silas's bed, her fragrance settling over Larry like a whiff of honeysuckle bush. He'd requested that a nurse draw the curtain between the beds, so now he heard, but didn't see. Baby, she said. You okay? Yeah, Silas said. He cleared his throat. I'm sorry, she said. About the way I've been. You ain't been no way, he said, but right. Rustling, sheets moving. Look at your arm. It's a mess, ain't it? They gonna put you on disability? Say they are. Full pay, 32? Say so. I believe that when I see it. They talked about the dog, the girl telling him she was glad she hadn't been the first responder. She didn't know what she'd have done. Something happened to him. He kept assuring her he was fine. She said she knew a great rehab tech. She'd make sure 32 hooked up with him. He'd get his arm back. Wait and see. Then their voices lowered, and Larry figured they were talking about him. He had the television on overhead, not too loud. Though Silas had a remote control on his bed, too, and though they shared the set, Larry maintained control. There were other sounds, and he knew they were kissing. A moment later, she stuck her head around the curtain. She had a high, pretty forehead and big eyes, a little smile. Larry? She said. Yes, ma'am. I'm Angie Baker. She came forward and touched the back of his hand, where it lay in its leather belt. Her nails weren't painted. He could tell she bit them. She looked into his eyes so frankly, he glanced away. I'm 32's girlfriend, she said, bending to get back into his sight line. You the one found me, he said. 32 sent us. I thank you, Larry said. I just wanted to say, the girl said, that I'm sorry for all you've been through. Silas told me, and I want to tell you, if you ever wanted to come to a church, the Fulsom Third Baptist on Union Avenue will welcome you. Larry didn't know how to answer. It was a black church. Finally, he said, does Silas go there? You ain't got to worry about Silas, 
she said. You can't get his black ass anywhere near a church, unless you shoot somebody at one. She stayed much of the night, was there when Larry drifted off. Next morning she was gone, replaced by a heavy woman with a bouquet of daisies, nodding to Larry as she got water for the flowers and tidied the room. Silas called her von Seel and thanked her for sending the deputies after him, and for the flowers. Then a man Larry recognized as the mayor of Chabot came and joked, could Silas still wave cars with that cast on? And could he learn to use his right arm to aim the radar gun and his right hand to fill out his reports? But all joking aside, the mayor said, they sure were proud of him. Later, a couple of other deputies came in and talked with Silas. They'd taken Wallace's snakes for evidence, and there'd been a moment of dark comedy when a heretofore unseen boa constrictor slid across the kitchen floor and was shot to death. They'd also found an aquarium of rats, food for the snakes in a back bedroom. A debate had ensued over what to do with them. Let them go, flush them. They decided to turn them over to a local pet store, the bunch of them currently in the back of Deputy Parvin's Bronco. Leaving, the deputies both nodded to Larry. French came by around nine, looking spiffy and wearing, for the first time to Larry's knowledge, a shirt with buttons on it and khaki pants. He looked rested and ruddy as he stood at the end of the curtain between them, where he could see them both. Gentlemen, he said. Silas said, you must got more TV today. So do you, the chief said. On your way out, that pretty anger wants to talk to you. At first, Silas said, can you undo Larry? I can, said French, coming down Larry's side of the divider, undoing the right restraint, and then rounding the bed to do the left. I apologize for that, he said. Larry rubbed his wrists and looked past the chief at the television, a cat food commercial. Well, French moved around the curtain to Silas's side. We got a fella doing your traffic. Thanks. French reached past him and pulled the curtain aside. Larry swept into view, his eyes on the TV. I'm going to talk to y'all both a minute, French said. Mr. Art, will you turn that thing off? Larry clicked it off. French said aside from the Rutherford girl's wallet, they'd recovered eleven firearms at Wallace's place. Pistols, rifles, shotguns, and ammo. Also most of an eight ball of cocaine, pills, an eighth of marijuana, and a pipe and a one-hitter. That sounded about like Wallace, Larry thought. French went on. The zombie mask had a spot of blood on it that matched Larry's blood, which, bolstered by Larry's testimony, left little doubt that Stringfellow had pulled the trigger. Also, because of the information from Larry, Stringfell had been linked to M&M, &M, so they could now investigate that case in light of this new evidence. French's guess? Wallace had shot M&M, &M too. Now you fellas, French said, looking one to the other, have got some history. But what else we got is a whole shebang of reporters and cameras, even CNN and now Fox News. They all want the story. When each of you gets out and... I don't see no reason to hold things back now. The parents have been told, and they send their apologies to Mr. Ott, nodding to Larry, and their thanks to you, 32. But I warn you both against getting too personal. They'll sink their teeth into anything you give them, try to make this a damn human interest story. I don't know about y'all, but I don't want no humans interested in me. Not long after, Silas was taken away in a wheelchair, discharged, Saying as the nurse rolled him out the door, I'll come see you, Larry. Now the nurse appeared with another wheelchair, this one for Larry. Your room's ready, she said. Never mind, he said. I'll stay here. Chapter 18 Angie had brought his cowboy hat and two of Marla's hot dogs. She couldn't stop touching him as she drove him to the Chabot Town Hall, and he finally took her non-driving hand in his good one and held it. His arm, in a cast and sling, hurt like hell, and he was tired. But it felt good being out of the hospital and into his hat. He'd just come from a meeting with Shannon, the sole reporter he intended to speak to about any of this. Let her scoop CNN and Fox. They'd met at the diner, and she recorded his story, growing more excited as he talked, already writing her photographer moving around the room, standing on chairs, squatting. 
The article, Shannon said, scribbling, would run Thursday. It just might get me a Pulitzer, she'd said. Will Larry Ott confirm all this? You'll have to ask him, Silas had said. Angie was chatting, and he could tell she was happy. Their plan was for him to go by his office, and then to her place, where she was going to put him to bed and baby him for the next few days. She pulled him to the parking lot across from the booming mill. You want me to come with you? No, he said, opening the door. I expect the mayor's going to reprimand me. I wouldn't want you to see that. Might lose all respect for me. Might, she said. I'll be here when you're ready. Mayor Moe and Von Seal were waiting in the office, her at her desk, him at his. Neither spoke as Silas came in, taking off his hat with his good hand. He tossed it on his desk and turned his chair around the way he usually did, for town meetings, and sat down. They were both watching him, in a way he couldn't decipher. Let me go first, Silas said. I got something to say. About what? The mayor looked down at his legal pad. Neglecting your traffic duty? Putting us in the hole in our little budget with a whopping, what, three citations in the last three weeks? Harassing the receptionist at River Acres? Enormous ER bills? I could go on, you know. Tapping his pad. He's always been a list maker, Von Seal said. All of it, Silas said. Look. Mermo tossed the pad behind him and stood up. What are we going to do with him, Von Seal? You could fire him, she said. But who'd you get to replace him on that salary? Silas looked from her to him. Only thing I can think to do, the mayor said, is hire him some part-time help. What you think, Von Seal? Yeah, she said, smiling now. I've been working up an ad for the paper, somebody, quoting from her pad, to direct traffic for starters. Silas didn't know what to say. Mr. Rutherford, Miramo said, has authorized it. He thinks we'd all be better served with you doing more patrols, what he called real police work. He said that? He did. And I told him we might start thinking about getting you a better vehicle, too. Next year. Maybe, what, a new used Bronco? Silas said, looking from one of them to the other. Thank you, all he finally said. But I can't take none of it. Not yet. You got to wait till the paper comes out. Why? The mayor asked. What's in the paper? You just got to wait, Silas said. He got up. For now, thank y'all. I need to go home and get to bed. He convalesced the rest of the day and into the evening, Angie pampering him, propping his arm with her big throw pillows, bringing him his grilled tenderloin in bed, taking the day off from work in case he needed anything. He sat studying her little catfish as it probed along the bottom of the tank. That night they watched movies in bed and slept close, and he woke in the dark, thinking of Larry. The next day, he asked Angie to take him to Larry's house, and then by the hospital. She helped him dress, lingering at his zipper, and they took her Mustang with her hand on his knee. At the hospital, she helped him with the box of mail he was carrying, tough with one hand. You want me to come up with you? Angie asked, balancing the box for him. No, thanks, he said standing in the parking lot by her car. I just don't know what to say up there. You ain't got to say anything, she said. Just go and sit with him. See what happens. He did just that. Came in the room and sat on the edge of the bed. Larry wouldn't look at him. Just gazed at the television, which was showing the cubs on WGN, losing, as usual. He put the box of mail on the foot of Larry's bed, but Larry wouldn't acknowledge it. I used to go there, Silas said, pointing to the television. Wrigley Field, when I was a boy. Larry raised his arm and changed the channel. Geraldo. Yeah, Silas said. They ain't no good anyway. I'm still feeding the first ladies, he said, getting them eggs. You know what I do? Taking the Miss Marla over at the hub in Chabot. You know that place. She calls them free-range eggs. Need to hire somebody to cut your grass. It's getting pretty high. I'd do it myself, but you know. Raising his sling. He sat for nearly an hour and then pushed himself up. Okay, he said. I'll see you tomorrow. Bring the mail. 
At River Acres, he sat with his knees crossed so he could rest his cast on it. Motherfucker was heavy. His elbow ached all the time, but he'd decided to stop taking the lower tabs. He didn't fool himself. The pain was penance. Were his visits to Mrs. Ott more penance? As she sat in her chair, gazing at him as if he were a broom, he dug up memories, telling her about him and Larry and them chickens, how that one afternoon long ago, when they'd been let to themselves, they'd bounded through woods and over grass, invincible boys, snagging grasshoppers out of the air and capping them in jars with air holes nailed in the lids, overturning logs for the fleeing beetles and cockroaches they yielded, stealing spiders out of their webs, taking the jar to the chicken pen where the birds zipped right over. Who are you? Mrs. Ott asked. Silas, he said, hefting his arm. Oh, she said. Who? Later he stood with the jeep ticking behind him, watching the Walker place. Kudzu and Privet had overtaken most of it, given the house another layer of mystery. Something moved past his foot and he looked down. A slender black pipe slid away from his boot. He caught his breath. The weeds twitched, and it was gone. He took off his hat and stood holding it, looking where her window was, behind its boards and vines, and wondered was her ghost in there, leaving a trail of smoke dissolving as she passes one room to the next. Next day, he tore the sheriff's department seals off Larry's front door and stuffed them in a garbage bag. Behind him, Angie, in a head rag and old jeans, came up the porch carrying a bucket with a brush and Ajax in it. She got to work cleaning the blood from the floor, and Silas went to the gun cabinet and started moving catalogs and junk mail to the kitchen table. It took him a while to get the cabinet clear and dusted, and then he went out to Angie's Mustang and opened the trunk. He came back in the house, passed her on her knees, wearing rubber gloves and scrubbing and humming, and went down the hall. For a moment he held the old rifle which Angie had helped him clean that morning. It seemed lighter than it used to. He took its walnut forearm with his gimpy fingers and worked its lever with the other hand, the smooth, ratchet sound, smell of gun oil, and admired its craftsmanship, the checkering on its stock, its bluing, in which he could see his reflected face, the nearly faded etching of a hunting dog on its forearm. Holding it for a moment, he was a boy again. The world, the world it had been a long time ago. A world full of unknowns. A world full of future and possibility. But then he reached and set the rifle down stock first in the green velvet oval and fit its barrel in its green velvet groove and it stood there. A thing returned to its rightful place. Silas inhaled. A man now. Full of unknowns yet. But, maybe, with some future still ahead. Some possibility. He looked a moment longer, then turned and went up the hall to where his girl was standing up, pushing her hands into the small of her back. Chapter 19 Silas had visited four days in a row. Larry didn't know what to say to him, so he said nothing. He enjoyed the visits, saw that Silas was nervous, but liked that he came so often. Liked, in fact, that he was nervous. Not talking was easy when you had no idea what to say, and, he supposed, it was his right. Yesterday's mail had included some new books, Lonesome Dove and some John Grisham's. Silas had also brought him a change of clothes, khakis and a chambray shirt, a pair of work boots Silas had put in the closet. It occurred to Larry that Silas had been in his house, going through all his things. Without being asked, he brought Larry's checkbook so Larry could pay bills. He was getting the shop mail, too. As if anticipating all Larry's questions, Silas would chatter about how the chickens were, which always led to Larry's mother, her condition the same. He asked if Larry knew when he was going home, but didn't seem to need an answer. On the fifth day, after Silas's release, Dr. Milton came by on his rounds and listened to Larry's back and chest and examined his wound, looking better, the skin around it less bruised. He shone a light in his eyes and asked questions and poked him here and there and seemed satisfied. He said Larry's wound looked good, and that his heart sounded decent enough, but that he should change his diet, eat less fat and more salad. He should exercise. Get up and walk the halls, Milton said. I didn't know I was allowed. You are, 
the doctor said. You are allowed. He was frowning. I want to say congratulations to you. But that's not right. Not for what's happened to you. Yours is a unique situation, Mr. Ott, and I can't imagine what it must have been like. But I'm glad it seems to be over now. When can I go home? The doctor turned to the door. A couple more days? I just want to keep an eye on that gunshot. Dr. Milton gone, there he buzzed the nurse's station, and the one who'd been so cold to him came in. He said I can go for a walk. She nodded, lowering his rail. His catheter had been removed a couple of days ago, and she set his empty bedpan on the table. She helped him to his feet and took his elbow as he eased off the bed. Thank you, he said. You're welcome. You need me to go with you? He told her he thought he could make it. He walked the halls in his hospital robe, wondering was the doctor right. If it was really over. When he came to the elevator he rode down, he stepped out and stood for a moment in the lobby, the glass doors across the room filled with news vans and people in suits standing in groups, waiting for him. None were looking now. None saw him. Women and men both, several with cameras. Silas would have already talked to them, given his story, so now they were waiting for him, for Larry. The elevator door began to close, and he stepped back in. That night, at ten, most of the nurses on their break, he slipped out of bed. Winded from dressing, he left his room and walked to the elevator and waited for the doors to open, wondering was this a crime? He didn't have his keys, wallet, or phone. Sorry now he'd not asked French for them. His pants felt big and he tightened his belt. He came out of the elevator in a warm darkness, an exit sign glowing in the distance. He heard someone cough in the dark gift shop and lowered his head and walked as fast as he could past the volunteer at the information desk, the old man putting on his glasses. Then, just as quickly, Larry was outside, over the sidewalk, not looking up, approaching two orderlies, lighting cigarettes. He nodded, and they nodded, and averted their eyes, stepping off the sidewalk, out of his way. The news vans had shut down, the reporters and cameramen probably at the motel. He put his hands in his pockets and walked as fast as he could across the parking lot, leaves scratching over the cracks and snagging on sprigs of grass. The night wind was cool, him alone with his shadow, crazed by the overhead lights, each with its orbit of bugs. Wishing Silas had brought him a cap, Larry stepped onto the sidewalk that went alongside the highway south toward the center of Folsom. That was a good two miles away, past fields and woods, past neighborhood after neighborhood with old-timey gas-burning street lamps and flower boxes, kids standing in the yards to watch him pass, dogs barking on their leashes. There were no taxi services in Folsom. Were there rental car places? But how would he pay? If he could just get to his shop, he'd be okay. That was beyond the town center, two and a half more miles. Long walk. He was out of the flooded light and passing a grove of pine trees, lamps ahead, but dark now. He wondered again, was it really over? Scary Larry. If anything would really change. Earlier that evening, before he busted out, he watched the news where the local anchor announced that Wallace's death had been ruled a suicide, that Silas, 32 Jones, was recovering at home, and that local business owner Larry Ott had been cleared of Tina Rutherford's murder. Wallace Stringfellow was now believed guilty of killing the girl, and, possibly, Morton Morissette, whose body Constable Jones had discovered two weeks before. Larry limped over the uneven sidewalk, in the dark breath of trees, his legs stiff, holding his hand over his heart. He felt in each beat a labor he couldn't remember and wondered what that meant. Sweat covered his face and drenched his back. His breathing was harder and he was beginning to feel pricks of pain in his chest. He went on. Silas was holding a bottle of pain pills, trying not to take one, when his cell phone buzzed on the counter across the room, its light reflected in Angie's fish tank. Currently on night shift, she'd been unable to get someone to trade with her and had left him alone for twelve hours. She'd been doting over him so much it reminded him of his mother, which he'd found himself not minding. Now he heaved off the sofa. 
muting the television and setting the remote alongside the phone. Yeah. A Constable Jones? Hey, John with no age. How you feeling? I'm not too bad. What can I do for you? Well, I'm looking at my computer here, and it don't say nothing about his being discharged, but there he went. Just walked out the door, and they make you ride a wheelchair, too. Every time. Wait, John. What you talking about? Larry Ott. I think he just checked himself out. Ten minutes later, Silas came down the steps of Angie's apartment, snugging his hat, then adjusting a sling, his jacket arm hanging loose. He had a bottle of water in one pocket and a plastic bag in the other. It was awkward opening the jeep door with his right hand and more awkward getting in. When he turned the key, the starter ground a few minutes longer than healthy, and he smelled gas. He waited a moment and tried again, and the engine sputtered to life. He discovered he could keep it between the ditches by working the pedals with his right foot, steering with his left knee and shifting with his right hand, a rhythm like anything else. Soon the Mississippi night hummed by outside his windows. Bug, bird, frog, the wind on his face. His elbow hurt, but otherwise he felt alert, clear-headed. He passed the hospital going east and slowed. Larry would have come this way, heading home. And there he was, limping along, his shadow tethered to his feet and elongated by the streetlights. Silas slowed and leaned across the seat and cranked down the window. Larry's face was pale and covered in sweat. Need a ride? He opened the door. Without an answer, Larry climbed in, nearly panting. He leaned back and closed his eyes. You want to go to the hospital? Larry shook his head. Home, he whispered. That might not be exactly legal, Sonny said. But home it is. They rode a while, Larry's breathing slow. Silas offered the water bottle, and Larry took it. After a while, he opened it and drank most of it. They passed through the quiet Folsom Town Square, the hardware store, now a tanning salon slash manicure pedicure joint, the drugstore a video rental place with a going out of business sign in the window, two closed barber shops, their poles plastered with stickers and graffiti, a block east, centered in a streetlight, a bent dog was eating something in the middle of the road and backed up as they passed. A box of chicken. Then they were passing strip mall after strip mall. Larry seemed content to ride, his eyes shut, as the buildings fell behind and the night closed them in. Though both knew that outside the windows were acre after acre of loblolly pine, fenced off and waiting for the saws. After a while, Larry's breathing had slowed. He opened his eyes, finished his water, then looked around the jeep. What model's this? Seventy-five? Six. Four-cylinder? Yeah. Silas had been driving slowly, he realized, like he used to with Cindy, not wanting to let her go, say goodnight. On those nights he'd wanted to hold on to her forever. Your carburetor, Larry said, cocking his head. Sounds like it needs rebuilding. Well, so I've been told. After a few more minutes, Silas signaled and turned and bumped by Larry's mailbox, where the familiar gravel ground beneath them and the familiar trees slid from the gloom of the headlights into passing night. A deer flashed across the road in front of them, gone so quickly Silas had barely raised his foot from the pedal. He slowed anyway. One meant two or three, and yep, here came the second, bouncing over the gravel. They passed the old walker place a moment later, the overgrown driveway. You couldn't see it, but if you could, all you'd see was privet and kudzu. The land had a way of covering the wrongs of people. You reckon, Silas said, if I was to bring this old jeep here, you might look at that carburetor for me. Larry took a moment to answer. I don't know how long it'll be before I open, he said. They told me I need to take it easy a while. I reckon that's true. Silas stopped in front of Larry's house, the old Ford truck waiting where Larry had left it. Larry opened the door and climbed out with his water bottle and stood a moment, the only light, the light from the headlights. I thank you for the ride. You're welcome, 
Sonny said. But wait, I may about forgot. He handed Larry the plastic bag, his wallet, keys, cell phone. Thanks, Silas. Larry closed the door. Silas waited as he made his way slowly up the walk. Halfway to the house, he turned over his shoulder. Silas, I suppose you could bring the jeep by here tomorrow. I got tools in my truck yonder. I'll do that, Silas said. They looked at each other for another moment, and then Larry turned and went on, laboring up the steps, opening the bag, letting himself in, flicking on the light. Through the pain, Silas watched his back stiffen in surprise, seeing before him his house made ready, washed of blood and smelling like Angie. Silas thought of the lilies she had left on the table, the gift basket filled with fruit, the cinnamon candles. Larry didn't know it yet, but his refrigerator was stocked. A couple of the beers gone, replaced by Marla's hot dogs. He didn't know that Silas had had satellite television installed. He didn't know Silas had taught himself to drive the tractor in a one-armed way, and that he'd been pulling the chickens to fresh grass, and that there were two dozen eggs waiting. Silas put the jeep in a first and eased off the clutch and began to roll. It was country dark, as Alice Jones had called these nights, the absence of any light but what she brought to the table. He sped up his eyes focused on what was before him, and drove toward home. And not too long after the jeep's lights had faded and the night grown darker yet, after a dog had barked somewhere far away and another answered, Larry rose from his chair on the porch and went in and walked down the hall and stood staring at the rifle, shaking his head. Then one by one he passed through the rooms of his house and clicked off the lights, the last lamp, the one by his bed. What he thought before falling asleep was that he needed to call Silas in the morning, tell him to stop at the auto parts house, get a carburetor kit for the Jeep. He, Silas, knew the model. This concludes the reading of Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter, a novel by Tom Franklin, copyright 2010 by Tom Franklin. This book was read by Kevin Kennerly. This unabridged recording was published by arrangement with William Morrow and Company, an imprint of HarperCollins Publishers, and was produced in 2010 by Blackstone Audio, Inc., which holds the copyright. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Audio, Inc. If you would like to obtain a complete catalog of our titles or our monthly update telling you about new releases, call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's one 1- 800-729-2665 or visit our website at www.blackstoneaudio.com Thank you.